Uh, it's yours, Charlie. Thank you. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, uh, Flora Ruzaganira. Uh, Flora, please tell us about your living history. So I'd like to thank the Living Histories team so much for including me and just this wonderful group of scientists. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure to listen to the YouTube videos and, and hear the stories. And um, I'm glad to be sharing a part of my story as a part of that experience. Um, and so I'm gonna describe kind of what I see so far as my history, which is still kind of, I think in the earlier stages, still have a lot to learn, um, but a lot of it is inspired from my experience in going through science and um, learning from parents and, and friends and family, and then also scientists as well, um, about the, the beauty of biology through chemistry. Um, and so I was born in Rwanda. Um, I immigrated with my parents to the US when I was three and we left during the Rwandese genocide. Um, and although the um, early part of my life um, that I mostly don't remember was you know, pretty tragic as we can um, appreciate now, um, the early life that I do mostly remember was actually quite wonderful. I grew up in an environment in Davis surrounded by university colleagues that were um, contained a lot of international students amongst which was my family. Um, my dad got his PhD in applied mathematics in the, um, the Department of Mathematics at UC Davis. His, um, uh, uh, his PI was Angela Cheer who had shared him. And I remember going to graduation and seeing my dad get this piece of paper that meant a lot to him. I didn't really know what that meant, but um, I was excited because he was excited about it. and. Um, a lot of the early um, uh, memories that I have around the university were really wonderful. And um, growing up in California, I also enjoyed exploring the outdoors with family and friends. And so seeing the biology around me was something that I also grew up um, enjoying. Um, and so not only did I get science from my dad's side, my mom also um, had participated in um, science at UC Davis, and she recently actually just retired after being a lab manager for a lab of Professor Beth Mitchum, who was in pomology, which then transitioned into plant sciences for 30 years. And so as um, a visitor to the lab, sometimes invited, sometimes not invited when my mom couldn't find childcare for that day, um, me and my brother would go in and visit the lab. And they, because they were interested in nutrition um, and specifically of, of what happens after harvesting fruits and vegetables and how that thing, how those get transferred to people and delivered um, and how nutrition is maintained and how to work with local farmers and in, in generating this wonderful produce that gets sent around the world. They did a lot of testing, um, either pest testing or just general nutrition testing on fruits and vegetables um, that were grown most of them grown locally in California. And so as a Californian, I also knew my fruit calendar pretty well because I would go to the lab and I'd be able to taste all the controls and I knew what exactly was in season um, during that time of the year. And so that was also a re really wonderful experience. And um, my mom's uh, PI that she worked for, Beth Mitchum and, and Dr. Cater, who's also pictured here, were both chair people in the department and both of them were really wonderful uh, mentors for me and in, in kind of promoting uh, my scientific curiosity and encouraging me to pursue science. And so I, I um, appreciate both of their efforts. And my first job as a high school student was in the same department. I was uh, an evaluator of peaches, um, working um, with Professor Tom Gradziel on peach almond crosses. And so I like to consider my early biology as genetics to table, as opposed to like farm to table, because I was being what the graduate students were doing in terms of you know, doing all this plant breeding and generating um, new uh, varietals and then being able to taste what was better and what was worse and how that went all the way from harvesting the fruit directly to, from the trees to canning and how that process um, kind of affected the fruit quality. And so um, both a lot of my early experience around science I wanted to highlight was really supportive um, and also um, just generally exciting. Um, and I think that that really played a role in how I viewed science going on um, later in my career. Um, and so uh, after uh, being a high school student, I went to pursue education in science and I went to three um, in universities that are within the University of California system in Northern California, um, starting at UC Davis and then going to UCSF and then UC Berkeley. Um, and each one of these universities had its own kind of um, unique uh, flavor of science, I'd say, and, and also kind of inspired me differently. And so I'll briefly go through those. Um, starting with UC Davis, I would say that I 
was a beneficiary of a university that really cared about undergraduate research in a way that was very practical. And so I participated in numerous internships and was able to receive research funding for small projects that I proposed and then also got little small travel grants to go to conferences where I would present that research. And I think that was really pivotal for me seeing myself as a scientist um, pretty early on. Um, and that played a, a key role in the way that I kind of uh, pursued science communication, the way that I communicate myself as a scientist to others. And I, I, I really credit a lot of that kind of early motivation through these research programs as contributing to that success. Um, I'd also highlight one particular interaction with the Dean of my, the college at that time, um, my college at that time, which was biological sciences and Dean Burtis um, had made special time for one-on-one -on -one time with undergraduates. And now I recognize that as a Dean, that's kind of crazy to have that <laughs> uh, ability to have that type of schedule for one-on-one -on -one time with students. And I had met with him during a time um, as a, a sophomore where I was wanting to take on a bigger project and not knowing kind of which direction I necessarily wanted to go into, but I was getting very excited about uh, coursework that I was taking in biochemistry, which was my major. And he, um, you know, encouraged me to pursue a project with a newer faculty member that was recently hired in chemistry. And now I can appreciate how generous that was for him to send an email and meet with me to talk about this. Um, and so I then um, joined my first kind of big research project with uh, Professor Jared Shaw, who's in chemistry, working on the synthesis of these natural products, which Jared's lab focuses on this total synthesis aspect of chemistry, which is starting um, from really simple, more available molecules to making complex molecules. And I worked on this specific project that was making analogs of this molecule Totorol, which has been shown um, to inhibit bacterial cytokinesis. And I um, was primarily just working on it on the chemistry side under the guidance of a graduate student, um, Dr. Michelle Kim now, um, who really kind of motivated me to really work hard in lab, ask questions. It was an environment where I, you know, was encouraged to ask questions where I felt like that was really um, helpful for me in terms of being able to pursue things that I thought were difficult in nature and knowing that I would have the support uh, for people from people that um, and kind of lead me forward. And um, it really was through this experience where I started to connect things that I was learning in the classroom to things that I was learning in the research lab in a way that I didn't expect, but all of a sudden somehow things like signaling cascades started to make sense after I appreciated things on the atomic scale. And um, it really kind of pushed me forward into the next um, two stages of, of my career. Um, the, the next one being as a, a graduate student in chemistry and chemical biology at UCSF, where I worked with Professor Kayvon Shokat. Um, and he really enabled me to embrace this concept of taking on risky projects, um, as his lab has kind of had this umbrella of developing small molecule tools to target what's so-called the undruggable. Um, and so in in his lab, really trying to think about kind of novel ways to use chemistry in order to understand biology and manipulate biology. And I was able to work on a project where I designed chemicals that would target kinases specifically um, in the context of infectious disease. And so I generated molecules that would inhibit um, a parasite, toxoplasma, which has its own kinases. And so this would prevent it from replicating within its host organism and then also um, inhibiting the function of kinases that are found in humans um, that are responsible for generating a replicative niche for viruses. Um, and so in this project, I was able to really kind of see this interplay between signaling that happens um, within us and then also in things that infect us. Um, and, and being able to see that connection between um, the activity of a molecule that was made um, by me in this case, um, to how that influenced the biology of an organism was really cool. Um, and as a postdoc with Nicole King at UC Berkeley, I think this is where the true peak of biological kind of excitement and uh, excitement over diversity of biology happened. Um, and that was, you know, being able to appreciate um, development as an aspect of something that is studied. And um, in Nicole's lab, I was really encouraged to think hard about questions that people have pursued with other methods and maybe finding a way for chemistry to have a space um, in order to assess the function of specific um, proteins or genes that um, have been critical in, in terms of evolution. And so 
in this uh, lab, I, I pursued a project which was working on tyrosine kinases and specifically looking at how we can use molecules to assess the function of tyrosine kinases that we know are important um, for animal biology. And this really um, connected um, the idea of small molecules to um, development in that I was able to see examples of molecules that are secreted by bacteria, for example, these ones on the right in green that um, influence coenoflagellates, which are the main model system uh, studied in, in Nicole's lab. And these coenoflagellates are protists um, that are the closest living relatives to animals. And these bacteria secrete these molecules that influence the coenoflagellates to form these large, beautiful multicellular colonies. Um, and we don't really know all the details about how this is happening, but definitely this interplay between um, this prey that the coenoflagellates eats, the bacteria, and the chemical ecology around this system was something that I found really interesting because it connected the atomic scale to really this developmental scale that I was gaining an appreciation for. Um, and so that is kind of the focus of what my lab has started um, in Stanford um, this last year. Um, we're still in our early stages getting um, our, ourselves running, um, but we're really looking at uh, this question of whether uh, tyrosine kinases and particularly receptor tyrosine kinases were important in this origin um, in the origin of animals and specifically whether or not we can use coenoflagellates as a model to study the function of these kinases and connect their activities to things that we know are important um, to animals and specifically whether or not colony formation in coenoflagellates is regulated by these kinases in the way that we see development in animals regulated by these kinases. Um, I'm really excited that this science is still very international in nature, and that's something that I appreciated kind of growing up in science and something that I'm seeing today is that the coenoflagellate research field is is pretty diverse and broad, and, and it's something that I appreciate and that, you know, we're working on this common goal of understanding the evolutionary biology that happened during the origin of animals um, and using our kind of diverse skill sets in order to get at this question. Um, and when I kind of take a broader look back at um, so far my trajectory in science, I would say that I didn't appreciate it at the time, but I definitely have been learning at length scales and starting from the atomic scale, learning about chemistry and molecules and moving on to um, studying protein function. And then lastly, looking at um, development in biology um, and how you know my lab hopefully will be able to connect these scales with something that I'm really excited about. Um, in the future. And um, with that, I, I will say thank you for giving me time to present and I'd be happy to take any questions. Great. Uh, thank you for a fantastic talk, Laura. Um, but on behalf of the audience, um, start out with a, with a question uh, from the audience. So you highlighted so beautifully how the generosity of people in uh, positions of power and prestige could be formative for an early career person. So uh, could you please share your strategy for um, inculcating the spirit of generosity in your mentee? Yeah, so I think one thing that has been really important for me when setting up a research lab is being able to hopefully create an environment where one, respect is kind of the foundation for the way that we navigate our interactions with each other. And then two, that um, nothing is like, a bad question. I think that that has, you know, been something that everybody says, but truly, I think, no, not like there aren't really bad, bad questions to ask. There's always something that can be learned. Um, and, and as a, a faculty member, I also do try to embrace the, the um, time that people gave to me um, when I was um, an undergraduate and, and a graduate student, um, really trying to give time back to um, trainees to spend time you know, discussing with me what they're excited about and if there's any advice I can give, also being able to provide them that advice. Um, yeah. All right, great, thank you, thank you. Um, so uh, another question, um, one of the themes of your talk was um, your expanding appreciation of biology and this came from, from chemistry, from studying biological diversity. Um, so when you're working, um, you know, with young people who you're mentoring, how do you encourage this same type of appreciation to develop in them? Yeah, I think different people get motivated in different ways. One thing that I find really 
um, unique about coinoflagellates in this field is that they're really just beautiful to look at under the microscope. And so um, we had an open house when I um, started my lab here just with a bunch of different protists. And it was kind of just like a microscope field day and people came and, and looked at things under the microscope. And that I found was actually very effective in terms of getting people excited about the biological diversity that they were seeing with their own eyes. Um, and so that's something that I do try to embrace a lot. Um, and, and also making that type of um, experience as accessible as possible. And so in that case, um, we had high school students in the lab, we had some of the scientific vendors brought their kids into the lab. And, you know, maybe this is like not super like approved in terms of safety. <laughs> but um, I think for me, I appreciated being able to have those experiences, being able to talk to scientists when I was really young in my mom's lab and, and being able to share that with others has been something that I've also tried to do. And yeah, so hopefully that kind of helps in terms of motivating the next um, generation of scientists to pursue science and, and diversity that they think and biological diversity that they think is exciting and important. Great, thank you. Um, thank you again for a fantastic talk. Um, in the interest of time, we'll uh, close out the recording now. Um, but 